District 31 House of Representatives. Um, you go ahead and introduce yourself and talk great. about yourself. That'd be great. And then we're going to ask questions. And please write your question down and just read it. Yes, sir. All right, you are probably more I'm going to sit there. Are you going to sit? No, no sit. I, I want to make it casual. I want to make right. this casual right. and, and me not right. answer some questions but not ramble on too much. Um, oh, I'll we stop said. you. Okay, oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, just throw you. something. You got something to throw at me? Just let me know. Uh, so I am Seven of Africa, as Lou said. Uh, I am a born and raised native Floridian. Uh, I grew up in Sorrento, but I uh, my family is mostly from Apopka. My, my step-grandmother's family came here in the 1870s. Uh, my grandpa's business, some of y'all might know, is Florida Cactus. Uh, they have a location in Apopka and Mount Plymouth, and uh, my grandpa is Hans Veldis, so if any of y'all have been around for a while in Apopka, you might remember him. Uh, I, I uh, you know, grew up, uh, grew up there in Sorrento after living for a little while in Apopka, and uh, my educational background includes a master's in public policy from Georgetown, and also a master's in religious philosophy from Columbia. my campaign on what I believe is important to the district, and so uh, trying to stay away from a lot of uh, the other bluster that's going on, as you all know, and you all watch the news, uh, it, is, it is a crazy time, but uh, this is a state house seat, um, I am from here, I have skin in the game, I have family here, I love this part of Florida, I've lived a lot of places, I moved uh, for you know uh, close to a decade after my undergraduate studies, I, I moved 15 times, um, so so I've spent a lot of time around the country, but this is where I always wanted to come back to, this is where I've always wanted to be, because I think uh, of all the places I've ever lived, this is my favorite, this is this is it, and so uh, I want to do something to help us, and I want to bring us forward, because Florida is a changing state, Florida is a developing state, and there's a, there are going to be a lot of changes, and so I believe that the state of Florida and this district needs a young conservative who actually cares about the issues the voters here care about, who keeps that in mind, who is going to fight for those, but also is going to hold in mind uh, and have the ability to make innovative, data-driven policy solutions for the future, okay? Because, because we, are, we are changing as a state, and we do need reforms, we do need to develop. So the first, my first and my top campaign point is the right to bear arms. Okay, and that's Thank at the you. Florida state level. That is not that is not talking about the Second Amendment. That's talking about the law that we passed recently, that Parkland bill that rolled back the age requirements on guns, and it also it, it, it brought in the red flag laws. Okay, I'm going to say first, uh, when I turned 18, I, I drove down to Sheep Street in Apopka, and I bought a 1022 Ruger long rifle. That was what I did. They ran a background check on me. I gave them all my information. I filled it out. They ran a quick background check. And I bought my first legal gun. I had shotguns before, obviously, but I bought my first legal gun. That was the first thing I did when I turned 18. And I wasn't—I still wasn't allowed to buy handgun ammo. I still had to get my parents to buy, you know, nine millimeter rounds and everything like that. But but that was what I did. And uh, some of my best friends uh, served in the armed forces. And I I believe that if you can go and serve in the Middle East at 18 and carry a weapon and and potentially die for your country, you should be able to come back to Lake County at 18 and you should be able to buy guns and ammo. And so I am, I am upset about that. That's one thing I'm going to fight for. Um, number two is these red flag laws are dangerous uh, because they can potentially open the avenue for activist judges simply through word of mouth, simply through accusation. The way the law is written, the way the law is written, that simply through accusation, uh, a judge or an activist judge could require your guns taken away. That's, that's, all, that's, that's how dangerous it is. And so um, we have to be careful. There's it. There, there are issues. We have due process in this country. If someone is dangerous and there's an imminent threat, we have due process in this country, and that's another story. But right now, the way the law is written, there's the potential for activist judges to push to take away firearms just from word of mouth. Okay. So that's that's my number one issue. Um, number two. I love to fish. I love to bass fish. I grew up in this area. We have some beautiful lakes. We have some beautiful rivers. I grew up about a mile from the Wakiva River. That's it. Most of it is crystal clear, sand bottom. It's a great place. I want to make sure that we keep our, our natural resources pristine. Uh, I grew up uh, the first few years of my life on Lake Heidegger in Apopka, um, which, is, uh, which used to be fairly clear, but it's right near. It was in that muck farm region around Lake Apopka. And 
that, that mug farm region, we know what happened. I don't blame the farmers. We didn't have the agronomy to know what phosphorus was yeah. going to do to yeah. that lake. And, and, but we know the outcome of it. So I want to make sure I do all my powers for us to reclaim those, those watersheds and those wetlands so that one day, you know, maybe Lake Apopka can be that bass fishing haven that it was 50 years ago, 100 years ago, that brought people like um, Frank Sinatra and Al Capone down to actually fish that lake. Okay? So Connie Mack, maybe not Al Capone. <laughs> But so that's my second. That's my my second most important issue. The third is I I hate what is going on with the erasure of our history. Yes. Um, I think it's absolutely disgusting. The Bible says, "Remove not the old landmarks which your forefathers set yeah. like. Right? Okay. And and so I believe that we have to view history in light of the times. We have to view history in light of the situation. We don't we don't hate Abraham because he was a flawed man. Uh, we don't hate King David. King David was made after God's own heart, right. but he was wrong in the matter of your eye of the Hittite. Yeah. And so, and so, the issue is that I'm a flawed person. I 100% am a flawed sinner. Uh, but, but the truth is that uh, we have to view history in the light of the time when it happened, and we have to understand our history. We have to know our history, and we we should not be erasing. We should not be tearing down, destroying what our forefathers have set up. And I think it's absolutely disgusting. So those were the top three issues that I put out when I first announced my campaign. Um, on top of that, uh, I was homeschooled growing up, and I had a great education. My my uh, my mother's brilliant, and uh, I owe all ninety nine point nine percent of it to her. And um, I I went through. I actually graduated with my associate's degree before I graduated with my high school degree because I did dual enrollment for uh, about three years at, at uh, Seminole State and at, uh, at Valencia. And so one of the major issues we have right now at homeschooling is that um, they're making it harder for homeschoolers to dual enroll. And in some of these rural districts and some of these areas with schools that aren't as good, uh, for example, the reason I dual enroll is because Mount Dora High School only offered two AP courses when I was in high school, two. Okay. I was able to graduate high school with 67 college credits. Okay, I would have only been able to get six had I gone to Mount Dora, and so that's why I had to dual enroll. Now, schools Mount Dora has improved; they have more offerings now. But but the point is that um, right now, there there some municipalities are forcing homeschoolers to pay articulation fees, and they're forcing homeschoolers to pay for textbooks, things like that. And not all homeschoolers are extremely wealthy, so that's a barrier to entry for homeschoolers to actually take dual enrollment courses and actually bolster their transcripts so they can go to a top tier university. Okay, so I want to roll that back. Uh, on top of that, um, I want us to be able to use, I am a huge fan of vouchers for both private schools and homeschoolers. I want to expand that and I want to expand and incentivize educational savings accounts because I want people to be able to, I want families to be able to use that tax credit, that voucher, that savings account for homeschooling and also going further, um, a lot of homeschoolers, I was actually in an umbrella school. So I was technically homeschooled, I was technically in a private school that held my transcript and, uh, and that way I could have a real transcript when I applied to colleges. And so uh, these umbrella <coughs> schools are often significantly less expensive than a normal private school. So that voucher basically uh, is close enough to virtually pay for uh, your your umbrella school enrollment. Okay, so that's one of that's one of the the, the impetus. That's that's an impetus behind me pushing this because it actually helps a homeschooler that may not really be taking classes but have a transcript that makes them uh, uh, makes them a better candidate when they're applying to college. Um, on top of that. Uh, one of the reasons I'm here staying before you is that at 18 I didn't have the money to start a farm. I, I grew up my family. My grandpa had a nursery. Uh, I would have loved to to just get some land and start a farm, which is something that was possible. 50. I I, I know many many uh, business leaders that it, even even Keith. You know Keith started uh, his farm when he was a young man. Uh, they were able to access land and credit at a young age to start a farm. Uh, one of the reasons I got the education I did was in hopes that I would make enough money so that one day I could have a farm. That, it's changed. It's changed in modern times. Young people cannot start a farm. The only way you can farm is if your family had the property already, your parents had a farm, or maybe you win the lottery. That's about, that's about it. And so what I want to do is I want to find ways to incentivize access to credit for young people and access to land so that young people can actually start their own farms and, and, and be independent. You have that local self-reliance. Uh, one of the main issues is that uh, 
it's easy if you are wealthy, if you're on Wall Street, if you're in Boston, if, if you have money or you have connections to raise hundreds of millions of dollars. That's, that's fairly easy. I know you can read of plenty of companies that do that. If you're a young person or a small business that needs a $20,000 business loan and you've only been in business 12 months, you're not going to get it because you need two years of returns. You're just not going to get it because they're, they're going to look at your statements and say, no, come back to us in two years and we'll decide if, if you're too high a risk. And there are a lot of barriers to entry um, to getting credit for businesses and for farms. And uh, on top of that, you know, uh, there's a lot of red tape for small banks and small credit unions that, that want to make those loans, but because they don't have the army of attorneys like a big bank does, it just, it, it just is not profitable for them, okay? Because it's, it's, it, it's spread out. For the big banks, it's spread out over so many loans and so many people. And so what I want to do is, is incentivize these small banks by cutting red tape and finding other, listening. Obviously, I don't have all the answers, okay? But I want to listen to these small banks and small credit unions tell me, hey, this is what's keeping us from offering these small business loans and these small farm loans, okay? And that's what I want to, that's what I want to find to take care of. Um, and then the fifth thing, or sixth, I don't know where I am at this point, but I've kind of lost count, and, I, and, um, and I want to keep it short because I want you all to ask questions, is uh, there's a concept, there's a, a Christian philosopher, regardless, the, the name is, is Lebanese, Nassim Talib, and, and he talks about this concept of anti-fragility, okay? And what that means is um, it, something that grows stronger in the face of adversity. Okay, and what I want for our communities is I want our communities to be anti-fragile. Okay, what we've seen with this COVID-19 issue is what we've seen is that um, we didn't have PPE right in this country. We just did. We were importing it all from China. Yeah. We didn't. We weren't making it here. Um, we have a centralized food processing system, centralized uh, uh, to such an extent that any hiccup, major beef prices rise 30 percent at the grocery store, 40 percent, right? Um, and across the supply chain, you know, where was hand sanitizer? Where was all the? Where were all these things? They were gone. And so I want to make us locally self-reliant and, and actually, uh, actually make our communities um, vertically integrated so that they strengthen in the face of adversity. And so with that, I've got Keith here now. I'll let uh, I'll stop talking for a minute and let him get settled. And uh, I appreciate it. All right. So the other Republican candidate running for the same position is Keith Trunow, and he is here now. So uh, can we get your coffee or water? Uh, what are you doing? There's a white right through there, all the way around the corner. And uh, shall we hold the questions until they're both done? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think that would be a good idea, too. Unless you, if anybody wants another card, um, we have cards. So let us know. Raise your hand and give me another card. Mine's just coffee and water there. We have another candidate in the room, too. Second, actually. Good uh, guy here. Mike Garcia is running for school board. He's in this big race at uh, San Diego, same seat. And Barbara Price is seated on the North Lake Hospital yeah. District Board. She's back yeah. there. She's not running for the election yet. Anita is going to be in that race for the North Lake Hospital District after the yes. primary, and Sue Hooper is also in that race. So we would like to see more Republicans on the North Lake Hospital District Board. And there's Miss Velma Dawson. Hello, Velma. Hey, how are y'all doing? We're doing great. Would you like to write a question? <laughs> if you would, would you like to... The County Farm Bureau is another one, and, and I'm the Youth Committee Chair at this point, but we, we work to... Uh, we work to um, create an atmosphere that that the youth of this county can can use and utilize. I also sit on the Harris Chain of Lakes Restoration Committee, which is appointed by the uh, governor. Governor then Rick Scott was appointed me to that position, so I I sit on that position for a reason. I sit on it for. A, not only an agricultural outlook on, on the lake system or, or the waterways or the quality of water. Or, I, I look at it from a property owner. I own a lot of property and, and you guys own a lot of property here and you want to preserve our natural resources and I believe it's, a, it's just something that is endearing to me because I care about this community. I care about 
how it's going to be and what it's going to turn into. So, moving forward, um, my concerns are your concerns because I've lived it. I'm real. I'm here. And I, I want to listen to what you guys have because I have faced many, many issues and processes and regulation and, and you know, trials and tribulations right here. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm willing to go to Tallahassee and do the same. I, mean, I got a lot of stories, but we can, we can just, I'll take some, we'll just take questions. My questions, all right. Well, we'll start with you, and then we'll, you can answer the same question. Sounds okay? good. All right. State awarded grant funding. When a crisis mm -hmm. comes along, it requires legislative action to extend, uh, extend, yes, <laughs> extend what? The, 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 spend the, down. Spend down here. Spend down. Okay, not not downtime. <laughs> Spend down here. Now okay. I got it. All right. And the question is, is there a provision put in place to allow extension without legislative action and allow for easier accounting when that extension occurs in the next fiscal year? And it's not is there, can there be? Yeah. And now, give me a little bit more background about this question. Okay, you say go ahead. Um, I sit on the governing board for Mid Florida Homeless Coalition, and I know this is quasi an issue there, but with any state grant funding, typically the cycle will end at the end of the fiscal year. Of course, with the current COVID situation, I know a lot of agencies are have had to cut down on services or whatever for obvious reasons. So they're not getting that money spent as they are were supposed to, not because they're not doing their jobs, but their hands are tied. So is there a way in times like this and, and to, to extend uh, the spin down of that grant funding requires legislative action to offer an extension to an agency that requests it? Is there a way to put a provisional or some template writing in place so when something such as this happens, it doesn't necessarily exist, uh, require a full convening of the legislation, let us legislative body. And one of the reasons that it's hard to get an extension is it makes that funding that you were supposed to use for that fiscal year extend into the next fiscal year, and it just mucks things up. Is there a way to create some parameters that allows the accounting of that grant funding for the previous fiscal year so it doesn't muddy things up. And I, again, I know one of the other concerns is that if we show, if we can't use this money, they don't think we need it. Well, that's not the case. Our hands are tied in some situations where it's not that we don't need it, we just physically can't. And that's not an issue with Mid-Florida, but with other agencies it may be or with other avenues of state funding it may be. Okay. Well, you know, when it comes to funding certain situations, um, you know, more more rules and regulations don't always help situations. Meaning, it, it could complicate. Not only would you want to help this initiative, but another group may take the same legislation you created to extend theirs and then all of a sudden we got more problems. So I would say that simpler is better. I mean, you don't want to create something that could ultimately be abused and in some way. So if you have a crisis like we do right now, I think that there is should be a way for you to make sure that the money, because you couldn't spend it, is there and available for you to utilize in the future. But creating new legislation, I don't think bigger governments better go. And I think that we just need to be cautious and use a case-by-case -case basis on, on the approach to solving the problem. But I'm not saying take your money away. I'm just saying we need to be careful about increasing legislation. Does the money have to be spent during the, I mean, when you allocate funds, I know in the, in the government, in the military, we had 
fiscal years and you had spending and you have to spend it during that fiscal year, you can't cross fiscal years. Aren't there the same kinds of requirements for, I would say, with the grant kind of thing? That's something that, I mean, is not so able to be extended. I have witnessed grant funding for water quality projects that don't get completed or et cetera, that they, they bump into the next year. There, there's usually so it can't cross the fiscal year? So, you know, that's what I would suggest is to find ways for that to happen. And, you know, I know you're saying it's difficult, but I don't want a blanket process that somebody else can abuse. Well, and I, I'm going to stop you there yeah. for a second and give you two minutes. Yeah, let me, let me just explain how I would approach this, is that this is an anomaly. This year is a massive anomaly. That's what that's what this is. This is it, this is not a black swan, however. The black swan, if you don't, is, is a concept of something that you couldn't see coming. Okay, that's not what this is because we should have been able to foresee that there is a potential for a viral sure. pandemic to occur. There are movies about this. Okay, so what we need is that we need legislation that that safeguards these sort of potential potential events in the future. Right, so so we need to have uh, legislation that actually says, in the event of some anomalous crisis, um, we are going to react accordingly, so that people uh, actually, so you don't lose that funding. You can't. Things were closed. You know, pe people could not go into work. People cannot actually. They were legally. There were there were lockdowns. They were put in place by people in power, which forced people from being able to actually uh, actually. Which was wrong. Uh, which was wrong. Which was wrong. And so. Um, they're absolutely, I believe, the way I approach it, and I don't know the leg I have not read specifically the grant, uh, the the bullet, the actual grant legislation in detail. I'll admit that, um, and this is something I'm having my campaign manager take notes on because I want us to dig into this. This is an important issue: is that if you are going to be, if you are going to have grants that are allotted to you, you should not lose those because of an anomalous situation over which you have no control. And that's how I would approach the situation, how I would approach legislation going forward. Regarding and I, it. I will say that the state has been really good in allowing us to reallocate funds, but our agency has been able to do that. I'm looking more at the bigger picture for agencies where that, ha that won't be a possibility. And then when you don't spin those down, it penalizes you the next time you apply. Okay, right. okay i got to move on, Chick. Sorry about that. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, I'll, I'll let you go first this time, uh, Seven. Uh, position, what is your position on land acquisition by state and property rights? Mm, mm, that's good. So my chief campaign advisor internship was uh, this eminent domain law firm. Uh, there is a serious, so I would say I have a background in and my campaign has a connection to fighting government overreach when it comes to land acquisition. At the same time, I grew up around the buck farms in Oak Lake Apopka. So I remember as a little kid that when they reclaimed all that land. And, and that was a huge issue because my parents were like, how dare they take that from the farmers? At the same time, uh, that was the only way we could have a chance at somehow salvaging Lake Apopka at the same time. So so there is, there is it's not so much a great area, but there is, there is there are two sides to this coin where I want to protect our natural resources. I want the state to buy land that is at risk, that is precious to us. At the same time, I want to stop government overreach because not all land is equal. Some land is more suited for development. Some land is more suited to conservation. And so what we need is, you know, the Bible says, rightly divide the word of truth. We need to, right, we need to understand and, and we need to rightly divide uh, what, is, what is land that needs to be conserved and what is land that needs to go into development. And so I would say there's two sides to that coin, um, but I am against government overreach when it comes to that area, also keeping in mind that there is land that needs to be preserved. Okay, good time. Great job. All right, Keith, uh, same question. Okay, cool. We have, I can't right off the top of my head quote the amount of land that people that they bought up in are not are, are public lands. Mm -hmm. And we so have that problem. Thirty percent of the state is now in federal or state control. Ma'am? Thirty percent of Florida's land. Thirty percent. So every time we had people come in here. Mm -hmm. Now that muck land because yeah. I knew the people that owned that and he was forced out yes, he was. to sell that. Yes, he was. And I'm sorry, 
but there were threats, and all of a sudden, he was killed. Oh. Now, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, you say, oh, that. you're a, uh, you're a uh, <clears throat> you're conspiracy theorist. Conspiracy theorist. <laughs> and I just don't think that was strange. When and I have looked into that, I have not looked into his, yes, his death. all of a sudden. Not. Yeah. And they forced the family up into South Georgia. And they still want to be farming. They love that. They, they have they have um, uh, history of many uh, generations. Yes. But and they told us a lot of lies, and I knew they were lies when they when they started it. Uh, they tried to say that that family uh, was polluting. Well, okay, yes, you say they didn't. We didn't know about what was happening. It, it, because they started that in World War II to feed the troops and feed Absolutely. people here. Yeah. And then they told us, oh, they were killing this, uh, that, and the other thing. Well, when they went in there and took it, over 200 million birds died yeah. when they did that. They weren't salvaging anything, so I don't trust them. But anyway, go back to how much of our land is um, in the, just Florida. Right. It's been taken. Every time they say, well, we've got money to buy this and we've got money to buy that. <laughs> Who's got the money to buy it and why are they buying it? Why are they taking it out? You take it off the tax rolls. You take it off the ability to produce something. Right. You have to have a reason. And I know um, some of our county commissioners <coughs> have tried some land to sell some of that land to take to get it back and to use. And so I, I know it's a, a pull of all directions, but if you really understand agriculture, and I think both of you do, you would have a better insight into which lands really could be put back into use and which lands could should, should stay in a, uh, a pristine or something. But people, you know, they're threatening to go uh, to go into these lands out in the southwest you can be yeah, arrested for what? You got a question? Walking. You got a question in there somewhere? Well, yeah. I'm just, I'm just saying, hey, what would they just, do just about? Succinctly, <laughs> just succinctly, let me, let yeah. me tell you. Like I said, not all land is equal. Yeah. Okay. And so, I agree that there is some land out there that is not preserved that needs to be preserved, yeah. and there's land that's being preserved that needs to come back into the yeah. system. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I am on this, and right. and I want to listen to the constituents to say, hey, Seven, this land, this pine, this this pine woods. This we can put back into agriculture, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and you know what? This basin by the Wakaiba River, that needs to go and be protected. And so mm -hmm. that's that's where I am on that, and that's how I will philosophically approach the issue. Okay, Keith, I'm going to read the question again. What's your <coughs> position on land acquisition by the state and property rights? Well, land acquisition, if done properly, is, is, is a tool, like many tools in the toolkit. You have conservation programs, you have needs for infrastructure, for roads and bridges and all kinds of good things. So I was part of the buyout in Zelda, right? I worked for LSF Wilkinson Farms at the time and we were part of the situation at hand. Now, it was an easy thing to do. You carry a big stick, you have a lot of money, you buy the property. Easy, done. Blame the farmer for, for, the, for the problems that were there and existing. Now, that's 20 years plus ago, and we are not in much better shape because of the situation. Now, 20 years fast forward, we have science and technology on our side. We have, we have ways to figure out how to be coincide with agriculture and the environment. Understand what we're going to do. Maybe we don't need to buy them. Maybe we need to find ways to enhance the agricultural activity so that we don't pollute or interrupt the ecosystem. So there's lots of things and then they bought massive lands that don't need to be bought. They should only go under the direction of their initiative. So if St. John's is buying environmentally sensitive lands then that's all they should buy and if they own lands that are not environmentally sensitive they need to sell those lands. Yes. Governor Rick Scott said <laughs> sell the land. They did not do it. I will make sure that gets done. That needs to happen because land is supposed to be used for what? It's best use, correct? Yeah, highest, and best. highest and best use. So we need to get those pa 
those lands back on the tax roll, creating income for, for the citizens of, of our district. I mean, we need to work hard. I understand it. I get it. Yes. Okay. Um, if I might. Oh, yes, go ahead. Sure. One of the things I find happening most often and as far as our legislators and how they interact with the rest of government, too often bills are written with good intentions, okay, like your St. John's Water Management District bills and stuff like that. And then the implementation of what the legislators intend is handed off to agencies and agencies, unless they who are have, not elected, uh, yes. exactly, <coughs> exactly, and they are respons They don't even. They're not even responsible for what they do to you. Amen. And that I understand stop. that very well. That I got lots stop, of stories. You know, so I have because I have a, they're sitting up there with their land acquisition group, part of FDEP, and these people are like three times removed from where you are. And, and they're allowed to be. And the real problem is... And nobody is, goes back and says, well, did you do what we asked? <laughs> no. <laughs> you know. The real problem is they have an initiative, and then the people that work in the initiative don't worry about working with us. So if you're a landowner and you've got issues, the people that work within that group yeah, if I could, work against you. If I you. could beg for one thing in legislation, is accountability <coughs> of our agencies to you. Amen. Amen. That, would that. Be, that would be wonderful. So, that's it. I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> All right, I'll let you go first on this one, Keith. What committees would you like to serve on in Tallahassee? That I know was, they're assigned, but if you could choose. Yeah, that, that was my question, and the reason is I want to know where your hearts Wait. are. I know you can't pick them, but... It's so it's a trick question. I want to know where do you really want to serve in Tallahassee? Okay, committees that you could choose, what would you like to serve? Well, number one, closest to my heart, because I live it every day, is agricultural and natural resources. Yay. Right? Yay. So th that committee, higher education, working with IFAS over the years on many issues from diseases to new plants and new, new technologies, by far, vocational technology, all those things. I want to make sure that, that that's that's near and dear to my heart as well. Okay. And training our, you know, go ahead. If you're going to be on more committees, tell us. You know, appropriations <laughs> yeah. would be a nice one. You know. All right, Stephen. What committees would you choose if you could? I would definitely go with agriculture, like Keith. Growing up in that community, I would go with education. And I believe I'm set for that because I will be one of the most educated people in the Florida House if I am elected. <laughs> um, and, and I care about homeschooling, so I want to push that. Oh, and then right. number three is the appropriation, like you said, because that is helping me bring money here. Okay. And that's another question here. Uh, what is your educational background and how have you prepared yourself for the job ahead if you're elected? Uh, you go first this time. So I received my associate's degree while I was still in high school uh, from Valencia College. Uh, then I went to the University of South Carolina, uh, world's number one international business program, triple majored in international business, global supply chain operations management, and finance uh, with a minor in Russian. And I'm not Russian, but I did have a minor in it. Uh, and then uh, I received a master's in public policy from Georgetown University, and then I received a master's in religious philosophy from Columbia University of New York. Keith, your educational background. My educational background is a vocational high school diploma, uh, military career, and, and vocational in that respect, and, and service to my country. And then when I came back, I went back into the agribusiness with, and worked for several people that molded me, taught me, showed me the way. Uh, I joined various groups, uh, tech, I don't know if anybody's in knows about tech or Vistage. It's a uh, CEO group that helped me mold my career moving forward. Um, of course, a lot of other boards, turf grass producers of Florida and, and et cetera, I've named them already. But just being in business, living through the day-to-day -day life with the challenges, ups and downs, raising a family, these, these are true to life, real experiences that I take with me to Tallahassee. Very good. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Keith, you get to answer first this time. Florida's budget will be down significantly due to lower taxes collected. 
what will you do to reduce taxes spending and instead of increasing taxes or floating bonds? Well, it's going to be a very tough road. I mean, with 77% uh, of the budget coming from sales tax and with this epidemic, pandemic, um, <coughs> tragedy that's happened, we're going to have a, a shortfall. And, we, and they don't even know yet how much that's going to be. So it's going to be interesting to figure it out. But I, I, by far, there are going to be cuts. There's going to be things that we're, we're not doing. We're, pro we're probably already doing things now and not spending money on things. So we have to take a case-by-case -case approach to what we need, what we, can, what we can cut, and make hard choices without raising taxes because raising taxes only makes the challenge even more difficult. So, you know, specifically, I have to get in there and get in the weeds and figure out what it is that we need to do, but I'm prepared to figure it out and overcome. Okay, thank you. Stavis, same question. Yeah, I am 100% against raising taxes. You're right, this is going to be, Josh Blake was in here the other day talking about how terrifying the, the county budget and the state budget is going to be and how difficult this is going to be. Uh, I would say that I want to get deeper into the weeds the way he has, where he, he recently worked to cut that business tax here in Lake County, is that I want to focus on these obscure local taxes upon which I am not yet an expert, but I, I want to focus on those because that's a lot easier to go after, to take a piece-by-piece -piece approach than it is to say, we're going to cut these mm -hmm. some, some massive statewide tax There's going to be there's going to be an army against that. Uh, real quick, I spoke with the tourism with with some of the tourism folks the other day. You know, they there's a, there's a, we have that tourism development tax. They love that. That's a huge lobby in Florida. I think it's going to be very difficult to get the Florida legislature to, to cut that tourism tax because they are a powerful lobby. So we have to be wise as serpents, harmless as doves, and dig in there and find what those obscure little ones are that we can start that actually impact businesses. Uh, on the ground level that we can start to pair back to actually impact people on, on a daily basis. Okay, okay. just, I, I submitted that question and you, t you said talk about city taxes. This is a Florida issue. No, no, no. And that's my question because this is a position for Florida. Yes, what I, I brought up Josh Blake's point because Josh Blake is a county council member and he is specifically talking about a, a tax that he cut at the county level, the business tax. Right. So what I'm saying, I'm using that as an example saying that that is an obscure tax that impacts businesses locally that he fought against at the local level, and I believe there are others of those at the state level okay. that, that we can approach you're focused and attack. On the state. I am okay. focused on the state, and I do know this is a state-level race. I am not talking about me going in and, and taking care of a Tavares City Council because I am not running for Tavares City Council. There you go. That's okay. the point. So okay. I apologize if I was not clear enough <laughs> yeah. in, in that. Yes, answer. George? One of my questions is a good follow-up, I think, okay. real quick. Instead of the taxing side, the spending side, mm -hmm. is there any part of the state government that you would like to see reduced or even eliminated? Yeah, 100%. The state budget is bloated. Uh, I've been speaking to some liberty-minded individuals, and I have a follow-up conversation with them to actually discuss what their goals are in that regard. Um, you know, my hope, and, and this might be an issue, is that uh, if we can expand homeschooling, Maybe we maybe we can reform some of our education spending. Oh boy, yes. So so that is one area, and, and I am not coming out against. Uh, I I want to. We want to expand as much. Uh, uh, we want to support education. I want to support education, but if we can expand homeschooling, that obviously reduces costs. So I would say that's one area where instead of instead of me being someone who's just coming out, cut cut cut. What if we can expand some programs? that by virtue of expanding them, we it, it, it necessitates a decrease in spending. I have a question. When you say sure. expand homeschooling, does that include like Florida virtual or are sure. those two separate? Sure. Okay. They are separate. They are separate, but they but they are in the same vein as in you know, the more children studying at home um, obviously necessitates and, and, and ends with a decrease. In, in spending for these for these places before they for schools. So absolutely, I think Florida, I've heard great things. I understand great things about Florida Virtual School, and so yes, I, I would like more people. I think this COVID nineteen crisis has proven that yeah, it, it can be successful and it can work both homeschooling and Florida Virtual School. And Keith, okay. yes, I, I think we need to take a long hard look at 
the spending in the state of Florida, and, and it's, it's a necessity to make cuts. It's a necessity to find areas in which we're spending things that aren't bring, bringing back the return on the investment for us so that we can focus on the things that will bring back the in, return on investment. So I'm, I'm all willing to make those choices and make those decisions in Tallahassee. Uh, did you get to answer that question? I did, yes, okay, yes, yes, thank you. All right, I'm watching my mouth. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see. Keith, um, they've written a question to each of you, but I want you both to get an opportunity to ask. So, um, how can we legislate more mandatory history teaching mm. from our grammar school um, to be taught? How can we mandate that? That's a good question. I mean, history is is a very a big part of our lives. I mean... We're eliminate it, what's happening right now in our country. Well, oh my gosh. Here's, how, here's how I see it. We, we learn most from our mistakes, correct? Yes. I mean, those are ingrained in our, our minds more than our successes. And I've made many, many, many successes, but I, I remember the disasters the most. <laughs> so, you know, we do fundamentally need to change the way we teach our kids because in the in the public school system it leans the wrong way and, and we need to try to focus on a fair and balanced approach to teaching and we cannot take history out of the balance. Thank you. And how can we legislate more mandatory history from grammar school uh, to be taught? So when I was in school in South Carolina, I learned that the state of South Carolina requires two years of state history. Amen. Okay? They require in, in, in grammar school and they require in high school, one year each. Okay? I love the state of Florida. I love our Florida history. A lot of people don't know our Florida history. We have a lot of transplants here. And I want people to know our Florida history. I want to legislate a requirement that, that actually has Florida history in there. Uh, the only the caveat and the dangerous thing is that Florida's educational system is extremely decentralized. In Texas, they have a state board of education. Mm -hmm. It chooses the curriculum. We know so they they can they can teach how uh, you know how science is taught. They can choose how history is taught in the state of Texas. In Florida, because we're so decentralized, municipalities have a lot more leeway. And so I'm what saying I'm saying is, educational <laughs> choices on textbooks are decentralized okay. locally. Right. Okay, so that is a risk if you're going to legislate. Uh, that history is, is mandatory because different districts can choose different textbooks and different ways to teach it. So we have to find a way to balance that because history is important. Before you got here, one of my chief campaign points is running against the erasure of our history and the erasure and the destruction of our monuments. Okay, that's one of my top three. And so, you know, the, the way I, I've been doing living history events for 20 years, okay, all through the state of Florida. And I can tell you that textbooks and all of that will never help you with history. Teachers don't teach dates, teach cause and effect. Because history was something happened in history that affects your life today. Teach it. We don't do that. We teach to the state exam so all the kids can go off to college. And all they have to do is remember that on this date this happened. They don't know what it did to them. So you're talking competency right. testing. Right. So, so but, why can't we not mandate history competency? But cause and effect, it, it, it's because kids don't know yeah, why look. something happened. Go to St. Augustine, for example. Absolutely. Absolutely. There is a little tiny dirt road that goes to something called Hewitt's Mill. Yep. Hewitt's, uh, John, John Hewitt's had, uh, cut all the lumber that built the city. What happened was 23,000 people were chased out of Georgia because they couldn't get along with their neighbors and they were fighting. <laughs> and, and so all of a sudden this cosmopolitan city with blacks and Spanish and British and Indians and all that was formed and they got along great until the people from up north came down and decided that they could run it better. I, I mean, and and that those kinds of things are not taught. Uh, University of Florida 
has a wonderful four-hour uh, movie and, and a curriculum. No, nobody knows about it and things like that. So um, I would love to see some support at the state level, our state level, on that. <laughs> Counties can't push it off. I mean, it, the state has to come down and start to... That's why I said there's, there's, there's two sides here, and we have to, we have to find that sweet spot, but I, I agree with you. Diane? Well, I just, if you will listen to what people are saying, they know, they talk about history, but they talk about it as if everything was evil that we're doing. Right. Everything was evil. They take the good, the bad, the ugly that we've always known, but they put that ugly side to it and they don't care. That just Abigail like that. Is doing that, that book that she's written. Yeah. Is that her name, Abigail? Wow. Uh, yeah, White for Jimmy. That's it. Yeah, well, that's yeah. it. That, that's and they're going to put that in K through 12. They See, want to and, do it. And mm -hmm. I think that's wrong. I'm sorry, yeah. it's wrong. Well, what about yeah. our Board of Education? Is that county or do we do state? We've got to look at our books I and we've both. got to say both. I agree with you. I agree with you. She spent a million hours sitting in the school board. <laughs> a million <laughs> hours, bless her heart. Yeah, she's and, a good uh, trying to get good books and it's hard. We need the state to come and we need to talk to them and say, look, we got to have textbooks that really tell the truth. And that one does not tell the truth. It's evil. Isn't that's, it, and that's, a long, that's a long conversation. Yeah. It, it discussing streamlining and, and state control versus mm -hmm. local control. That's a whole, that's that's a long conversation we don't have time for today. But so if, if you, you reach out, the same no, I'm just saying, if you, if you reach out, we can, I, I'm not sure, I'll, I'll like keep I'm not sure what we're I don't want to okay. run off the last <laughs> That's all right. Um, okay, Stephen, how can our school government really catch up with educating even teachers against books like, I think it says Abigail. Well, that I could. That I could is yeah. very it's harmful. called White Fragility. Right. Yeah, I know, yeah. I know okay. the book you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. All right, so did we address that already? Uh, um, exactly. How we can uh, get our schools to handle this? What do we need to do? Okay, well, we did we did sort of touch on this okay. regarding the textbook choice, but once again the issue is that we have to be very careful with understanding that whatever, uh, that those, cho those choices that we make with textbooks can also be undone. It, it, this, is, this is not a simple, this is not a simple solution and you can't change who's teaching your kids uh, okay. overnight. And so this is this is a huge issue. It's something we need to delve into more. Yeah. I don't think I have time to really to okay. really dig into this. All right, Keith, right do now. you want to speak to that question too? Again, it comes back to fair and balanced uh, teachings about the, the truth of what, how we we were formed, how we've gotten here, the trials and tribulations of everyday life, and so we need to focus on making sure that the curriculum states the facts. So we need to move towards that somehow and I'll, I'll work to, to help to do that. Okay. May I pay you very quickly? Sure. It doesn't matter what we teach our kids. If we have damaged families and damaged students and don't address things on that level, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what we teach them yeah. and yeah. what we advocate for. True. So I don't know how you fix that, but... We advocate for strong families. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Florida does. We need more, All right. more fathers um, and families. Oh boy, the jails are full. You know, because you do jail ministry. Keith, I'll years. give this question to you first. Uh, what projects have initiated successfully? I think it means what projects have you initiated successfully that benefited residents of the state? What projects have you initiated successfully that benefited residents? Well, sitting on the Harris Chain of Lakes Restoration Council, uh, advising uh, leadership in Tallahassee on, on issues that affect us, um, we've effectively, you know, sent information to them to help do their job. So when we, the, the Harris Chain allows for folks to come in DEP, FWC, St. John, Lake County Water Authority, University of Florida, all those people will have to come to that board or that council once a month 
and we would essentially talk about issues that each one of those tag members would have. If they're working on a project for hydro maintenance or water quality out of Lake Apopka or, or something like that. And then we would ask for more scientific data or some, uh, groups or people that could come in and help with the understanding how to move forward with a better plan. So a lot of those things have happened over the time. A lot of great things have happened with the Chain of Lakes because of the Harris Chain Council. So that's one way. The other way is giving back to this community through 4-H and FFA kids, projects in the, in the county fair, with Farm Bureau advocating for young farmer and rancher groups. I was a young farmer and rancher. I was young farmer and rancher of the year in 2003, picked by Florida Farm Bureau. My family, Dodie and I, were, were the farmer and rancher of the year. So those programs have been monumental, and we keep working and building on those programs to allow kids to be successful. Okay, thank you. Stephen, what projects have you initiated successfully that have benefited our residents? So, so since Keith brought up uh, young farmers and ranchers as well as 4-H, I also I grew up in 4-H. I grew up, uh, I've spent time in young farmers and ranchers. I've also been involved with all of that. What I will say is I served on the Alachua County Rural Concerns Advisory Committee. So well, it was an advisory committee, it was now a legislative committee. And, uh, uh, but we worked on, on uh, access for high-speed internet to rural communities. Mm -hmm. and, and that's not a major issue so much in this district, but that is a major issue across the state for rural areas with people for both businesses and for educational purposes for families that don't have access to high-speed internet that severely holds back the economy and also education. And so even though it's not an issue that is directly uh, about, I think it's around 94% of the district has access to high-speed internet, okay? So access, not doesn't happen, but access. Uh, across the state, that's not the case. And so that is something that may not directly impact the district so much, but something that I care about uh, that I want to improve in the state of Florida. And I came further. from a part of the Panhandle where you exactly. uh, trouble with internet access, period. Still had to have a landline. Yep. 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 <laughs> okay, this is the last written question. If anybody else has one, pass it over uh, or read it when I'm done here. Um, let's see. Stevan, thank you. Um, how can a county or city mandate wearing masks? As what happened in Orange County, it is unconditional for governments to make. Is it, is it unconstitutional for governments to make mandates on its citizens? I'm just going to say yes. Okay. That's, that's all. For 17. <laughs> yes. Um, it is. It, it should be a, a choice of the people. Okay. So. I don't know. I'm wearing pants right now because I'm not allowed to walk out of my house without pants on. Yeah. Well, you, 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 you have a choice. Yeah. To walk you can. Yeah, but I'm going to be arrested for public duty. Uh, well, if you have, you know, bottoms on, you're probably okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? I can't walk into Publix without a shirt on. Right. So I don't, I don't understand that. You, you know, it's a common respect for for your fellow Floridian as well. It's a I mean, moral issue. It is. I mean, if, if you know, this is a problem with the COVID. So. You know, we need to be mindful and respectful for those who who may be more susceptible. Um, I agree. Yep. But the, you know, for the mandate. All right. Uh, this is a question that has is going to require three answers. So, uh, Keith, you can go first on this one. What do you consider the proper role of government at the local level, the state level, level, and the federal level? Um, and I'll give you a minute for each one: local, then state, then federal. What well, do you consider the proper role of government <clears throat> at the local, state, and federal level? It, it's all about, at the local level, it, it, these will touch all three, really, but less government is more, but, you know, personal responsibility, family, you know, those things we should be able to do ourselves. So the government should, local government should, always work to enhance our community, to help strengthen our businesses, help strengthen our families, help strengthen our education process, and all those things. They shouldn't be overreaching. They should assist us, not hinder us from getting that done. 
state level the same way, the federal government the same way. I mean, that's why we have limitations with, with the Constitution for the, for the federal level and the Constitution for the state level, and then we have local rules and regulations we have to follow. I think we need to keep those in check, keep regulations in, to a limited basis so that we can encourage families to be families, encourage people to make personal good choices. Good things happen to good people. Bad things happen when you make bad choices. So we need to encourage family, encourage the strength of the, of the community, and more, more getting the community to work with each other. Seven, proper role of local, state, and federal governments. I, I will be very succinct with this because we need to roll. We have another meeting. Um, okay. The federal level is pushing the country in a certain direction. This is we want we want small government. We want hands off. We want to to promote um, the least federal overreach as possible um, and continually like hand that hand that down to the locus uh, to the local level. And to the to the most on the ground, the most the closest level to the actual people. And so there, I believe there should be it should be stratified as in the least influence <coughs> there, and slowly dropping down so that the local areas have actually the most control. And that's and that's the full that's the direction I'm going with that. And um, please email you have my contact info mm -hmm. if you want more on this. Well, Cole and I were already seven minutes oh, over, oh, and we need a, we need a roll. Okay. I will take a part. Thank you so much. I, I apologize having to run, no but, but we do thanks need to get out here. Thank you all so much. Keith, thanks Thank for coming you. out. Thank I appreciate you all. Good to see you. Thank you so much. You can see Walter. And you can see, see Stephanie tomorrow yeah. afternoon John, 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 three and six. Yeah, yeah. that a black one. Or or and Keith, you also have the uh, black. Oh, black. Okay. Yeah. He has a fundraiser today. Yeah, yeah. 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 what they felt like. Yeah. You also have a, a meet and greet fundraiser coming up. I just today. announced Stephanie's. What is yours? My name is Rick Baker, property appraiser's endorsement. I have David Jordan's, the tax collector's endorsement. So. You know, I've been a part of this community for a long time, and people understand that we have to have commitment from the people we send to Tallahassee. And I'm prepared. I'm, I'm ready to make that commitment. I, I, in my life, I've, I've been able to um, get it. I'm in a position that I can take the time to go to Tallahassee. If I was a few years ago, no. I was in business and I was to the grindstone answering questions every day and taking care of people and making it happen. But my business model has changed. I'm more focused on business development. So I have time. My kids are a little older. They're teenagers. They're young adults. They're, getting, they're molding into what they are going to be. My wife is behind me. My business is behind me. So... I had a great turnout last night. I mean, we probably had upwards of 75 people, and we, we had a, a, a very good success in, good. in the fundraising. Good. Okay. Are you going to have another okay. meet and greet? We will. Uh, to, be, to, to be determined, there's going to be a couple more. Um, good. Probably, probably one in Umatilla, and, and the other one will probably be at uh, the Mission Inn. Okay, so Mr. you can Future let us City. know yeah. here at the office, and we'll yeah. spread the word. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we're from Orange County. Uh, do you okay. have any plans to do meet and greets in Orange County? I do. I do. And, and I've talked um, about doing one at the plantation. For those of you who know what that's not called the plantation oh, anymore, is it? Manor. Yeah. Manor. Um, or, or at the shrine, which is in Seminole, but we may not do that. I've, I've been talking with the, uh, the mayor a little bit and uh, some other folks in the area. Um, I bank. In, in Apopka for a long time with Seacoast, which was bank first. Yep. Um, so we'll put one together in Apopka as well. Yeah, please do. Yes. We, we, you know, we sometimes get a little forgotten because we're such a small oh, chunk. I understand. Yet, so no, I think it's a It wasn't always that way, but redistricting helped us out a little bit. I mean, as far as, you know, getting us divided, you know, a lot of it. I, I just had one quick question I wanted to ask. Yes. You don't mind. No, um, I've been very concerned, uh, having volunteered in the schools and the elementary schools and stuff like that over the years. Um, 
I'm very concerned about what these kids are going to come back to school with. There's going to be a huge disparity between the kids who have the computers and the internet knowledge and stuff like that, and the kids who simply, the parents don't know how to teach them, not equipped to teach them, they're trying to work from home or, or just, you know, they've been on the unemployment thing. There's going to be a huge gap, of knowledge gap for these kids, and I don't, I wondered if you thought maybe there might be a way to, um, with, if you're in the legislature, how can you impact that re-entry for these kids so that they can all get brought back up to speed again? That may require some additional educational funding with some directives or whatever, but you know, it scares me to death to think what these kids have not been learning since they've been out of school. I understand. So mine, mine have been at home too. So it, it's been a, it, it's been a struggle in both. So I'm essential, my wife's essential, so we, we work too. So, you know, for our kids to be on computer and do the things they need to do has been a challenge. Um, but they're also doing FLBS during the summer to, to do a do their do an extended class, right? So but I understand there's folks that don't have access to internet properly and, and other things. School is Bricks and mortar school is very important, even to my kids and, and all kids. But I think we, we've got to find a way to make sure we get back into schools with these kids. This, this interaction is, is key for development. And, and if we just need to figure out a way to make it happen. Just bringing those kids back up to speed again, yeah. to the, even yeah. to their peers, we, we have is going to be a challenge. You know. Well, they've been talking about the fact that the children are very depressed yeah. and anxiety-ridden and all. Just getting back in with their friends at school will be a big lift. My and then we will, we will help get them back. Oh it was a lot of talk at one point about year-round school, and that seemed to have fallen by the wayside. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't necessarily agree. My my, my personal beliefs in, in year-round school. I mean, there's opportunity for kids in the summertime, just like my kids are taking advantage of of school right now, extra classes to get advantage. But that's all again through online, and yes, your, some yes. of your ones that need that do not have that access to that support at home, and those are the ones that come back into school so behind. The ones that have that access. Whether the school was there or not, yeah. aren't going to be as negatively impacted. So th there are groups, you know, my kids are also in scouting, um, in a troop, and, and there's activities going on that will help. You know, there's other families and parents that are helping other kids. So again, we need that community effect. We need people helping people, which we don't see as much as we, we should. Shay, when they were doing um, year-round school back in the 80s, it was horrible. Because um, the kids would be out for three weeks at a yeah. time, oh, and then yeah. the teachers had to take two weeks to bring them back up to speed. Um, the, at that time, I was living in Orange County, and then all of a sudden the <coughs> county couldn't afford all the buses because they were busing all the time. Um, they, if you had my sister had two oh, kids in cool. grade school and two in high school, and they couldn't get them on the same track. Yeah, well, I, I know the downside. We don't need all these persons. It worked very well in North Carolina when we lived there. Can, can we focus on the candidates? Yeah, really. <laughs> and that has oh, nothing to do with the state. Well, not a question. Does anybody else have a question for the candidate? Right. Oh, Walter. Walter. I have a question. I want to ask you a hypothetical question based on a true historical situation. Um, let's suppose that you're in the Florida House and uh, they've allocated about a million dollars in the budget for one of your district's projects and then all of a sudden in the blink of an eye they come up to you and say oh by the way we want you, the, the speaker comes to you and says we want you to vote for red flag laws and for uh, raising the age from 18 to 21 to buy a long rifle and if you don't we're going to pull that funding that was already allocated to you out, and you won't have it. What would your answer be to the speaker? Yes, I'll vote for that, or no, my constituents would not be for that. Well, understanding where this constituents would be for, but I mean, long gun rules, in my opinion, are essential to 
early development and learning. Kids need to learn how to handle and protect themselves or be safe with weapons. Um, but those issues will come up, no doubt. Um, you know, those are questions I've already asked. But we need to work with our delegation to ensure that the programs we do come up with have merit and they stick. I, I feel that I can do that. You got Senator Baxley, Representative Haig, Representative Sabatini, and Starchin, Senator Starchin. So but they will try to they'll try to uh, persuade. Yeah, they'll I try to, to bludgeon you into right. submission. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I, so the question I, is, can you simple. be bludgeoned? Yes. No. Yeah. I'm not being blood. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mentally, I, psychologically, I understand. I understand. I, look, we. I want to bring it back for Lake County. That's my pledge for sure. Okay. You have part of Trump's heart. <laughs> All right, and Vance. Yes, Vance, uh, you have. You don't know me well, but I'm kind of like the local fiscal watchdog. And I have a lot of budget and finance background and audit background. And I regard Florida as like the huckster state. I've got a whole list of issues on the blog that I write. I call uh, Florida the huckster state because they have all these things where they don't make any sense from a fiscal or management control standpoint. It's all just politics or emotion. And a good example which people heard me talk about is that the the forming legislation that created all the the constitutional officers has no requirements in any of them that they have budget hearings that they provide detailed budgets annually on their website um, or that they have any kind of operational audit at any time so all of our constitutional officers the ones that just got reelected here and they all know because I ask them this all the time is why don't you request, because the rules are that the court clerk will has the inspector general, he will not initiate, he does not feel he has the power to initiate performance audits to ensure that they're efficient, effective, and that they're complying with the legislation that created them. And nobody does that. There's nobody uh, over all the districts that we have in this state. There's one guy that's an administrator, but there's no one that goes in and audits those people. The Lake County Water Authority, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so, so my question is, you've got business background. Will you do anything maybe to try and get on one of these fiscal committees and, and try and improve the what I consider to be the business oversight over all of these agencies? Yes, I would. I would, I would enjoy that. I got it. I got it. Now, <laughs> now, with that being said, if you ever been to a Harris Chain Council meeting, I have. Council. So, do you all know that we all wrote a letter to the legislature to enact OPAGA on Lake County Water Authority and St. John's? No, but didn't they just close the, yeah, the, so the some committee? Yeah, got a little mad, didn't they? <laughs> <laughs> they got fired up? Yeah, well, that, then you have so, to get yes, on a bigger I stump. I understand. And I okay, agree. because, I like, I talked to things. Ross Spano the other day. The GAO from the federal government just came out with an audit that says that the IRS paid a million dead people yes. the funds for that. I've got the audit report. It's 400 pages long. And there's no excuse for this. So and who that cash those checks? That's yeah. what I want to know. Elected officials should be starting to get concerned and responsible for that like you would be for that's your business. Terrible. And that's what I'm asking. Thank you. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? A question? Anybody want a donut? <laughs>